thank you for downloading this recording from the Thames Valley Churches of Christ. This sermon, delivered by Malcolm Cox, was part of the special Shine Weekend in May 2016. The title of the sermon is simply Transcend. We hope you enjoy what you're about to hear. We've got a lot of budding talent around here, haven't we? My word. Thank you so much. (laughs) Reaching for something. Reaching for something. Life feels like often we're reaching for something. The world looks like everybody's reaching for something striving for something, looking for something that, that we might call the transcendent, the things that we hope will get us in touch with that which is deeply meaningful and spiritual. The transcendent, the spiritual, the universal, the meaningful. As it says here in this passage in Ecclesiastes, you've got to set eternity in the human heart. And I guess that's why we're here today. We acknowledge that God has set eternity in our hearts. Or we hope to figure that out, or we have a sense of it. We have an inkling of it, and we'd like to know, how do we get in touch with this? Because it seems to be, a lot of the time, so far away, out of touch. And perhaps the things that we achieve in this world, personally but also as humankind, are attempts to touch the transcendent. Why is there always still a need to build a taller building? I forget which country it currently holds the record for the tallest building, but another nation will come along and and build a taller one. There's nothing wrong with building tall buildings, but why do we feel the need for an even taller one? Or an even faster car? Or an even slimmer waist? Or an even faster way to lose the weight, to get to the slimmer waist. Reaching for the moon, but then human exploration, thinking about going to Mars and sending satellites beyond our solar system. New drugs, not just new drugs to treat uh, medical conditions that we're grateful for, but substances that are manufactured and designed to create some kinds of experience and pleasure that are somehow felt to be better than what we experience in reality. I think all these things are a search for the transcendent, an attempt to touch the transcendent, things that are bigger, higher, purer, more glorious, more amazing than we currently have an experience. None of the things, most of the things we've talked about there are not necessarily evil, but they touch on something that really matters to the human condition. These teen movies, teen aimed, aimed at teens anyway, seem also to me to explore this, this and other movies uh, like, like them, trying to find the, the, the secret of what life is really about and what we are as people and who we are and what we're meant to be. So what I want to do for a few minutes is let's talk about in what ways our great God is transcendent and what that means for us. Our God is creative. We've seen that here today with music and various other things. In Genesis chapter 1, we see this uh, summary I'm going to give you here of creation, showing how amazingly creative our great God is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, that is such an understatement, isn't it? It just sort of just happened. He just did that. Amazing. He created. Let there be light. And there was light. No one was arguing or denying his ability to do this. Sorry, God, it's Tuesdays. You can't create light on Tuesdays. No, he is not. There is light. And there was evening. There was morning. The second day, God called the dry ground land to gather the waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. And the creation is good, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's amazing. 
Let the land, he said, produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars, like a throwaway. Oh, yes, he made the sun, he made the moon, and oh, he made the stars too. We'll come back to that later. So God created the great creatures of the sea, every living thing which the water teems and moves about in it according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. God finally created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female He created them. God saw all that he had made, and it was better than good. It was very good. Hasn't God made an amazing world? Isn't he so creative? He thought all of that out of nothing. Not only created it out of nothing, but thought it out of nothing. There was nothing to compare these things to before they were made. Now we make things that we compare to other things. But he had to and did decide to make things that no one had ever conceived of before. Astonishing. The stars and the galaxies, the things that are large, which we'll talk more about, and the things that are small. The beauty of a snowflake. You remember even as a child, perhaps now you take it for granted, but you saw snow and, you, and you, you saw, yeah, maybe a snowflake landed on your hand and you looked at it. Perhaps you got a, mic, a, 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 a magnifying glass before it melted and, and had a look at the beautiful, beautiful crystal uh, uh, construction there. Isn't it incredible? Or perhaps uh, uh, birds are more your thing. Birds that beat their wings so swiftly we can't even see unless you slow it down. Uh, how they're beating their wings and you slow it down uh, on some kind of film. Things that are tiny, this little seahorse that's two centimeters long. It's about that long, yeah? Tiny little thing. And there are millions of these things floating about in the ocean having a nice time today (laughs) while we're sitting here. And we don't even know about it. Isn't it incredible? The seahorse. Incredible. The beauty of the nation, of the cre- of creation and the beauty of a sunset that we all really love. And then there's the creativity he's given human beings. <laughs> now, after I put this slide together, I realized it looks a bit like Anna and Fun Lola are worshipping Alex there. I, I, not quite quite sure that's what's going on or are meant to be acting and music and all of that then there's the some gifts that God has given other people the gift of hospitality the gift of knowing how to cook salmon properly that's an important gift not all of us have it but I'm glad somebody does the gift of love Oh, <laughs> Richard's creativity in the way that he speaks and preaches. I love that. And Anthea's creativity with her meditations and ways of expressing the deeper things of God. People like Tony Heath and the realness with which he's able to preach that I would love to, I aspire to that, that sort of um, a depth and common touch put all put together. Astonishing thing. How lucky we are. And I'm only scratching the surface, even if any of us were just to look around now in this group here, we'd see in every single person, if we know them, the creativity, the creative ability that God has given that person. How enriched we are to have people in church, in our families, in our work situations, in our lives that demonstrate different parts of God's creative nature. None of us have that all, but God has it and gives bits to each one of us because we're made in his image. How are we lucky to know that God? What about God the engineer? Job 39 talks about the ostrich, which is an interesting thing. The Bible talks about the ostrich. Hmm. And it flaps joyfully. I love that description. Of course, it's flapping joyfully and swiftly, but it's not getting anywhere, is it? It can't fly. What a strange thing to create. But it, it can run. 
it can run. It says she laughs at horse and rider. Uh, and they, those things can run fast. Um, <laughs> they, they can run in short bursts at up to 43 miles an hour. If they were doing that on some of the roads around here, they'd get a speeding ticket. I mean, you've got to catch it first, but that's amazing. And they can go steadily at 31 miles an hour, steady, for long, long periods. One stride can be as long as 16 feet long. 16 feet. So what, they get through this room in about three, four strides, bang, 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 bang. God, just amazing, huh? God made that. I don't know why. <laughs> except that it provides us with some amusement. But it's amazing. Their claws are strong enough to kill a lion. They have a four-inch claw. Don't want to mess with an ostrich. Don't want to do that. God, the engineer, he knows how to make things just right. The human skin. One square inch of skin contains four meters of nerve fibers. One square inch. Four meters. It contains 1,300 nerve cells, 100 sweat glands, 3 million cells, and 3 meters of blood vessels. Other than your brain cells, in your body, 50 million cells will have died and been replaced by the time I finish reading this sentence. 50 million in just a few seconds. I think God knew how to make things pretty good. The central nervous system is connected to every part of the body by 43 pairs of nerves. 12 go to the brain, 31 pairs, spinal cord. 45 miles of nerves are in your body. No wonder you feel nervous sometimes. The, uh, you've got 45 miles of it. 45 miles of nerves. That's, that's as far as I, my, I live about that far from, yeah, about that far from here. So that's like my nerves stretching all the way up the M3, around the M25, and into Watford. Just my nerves, let alone yours and everybody else's. Isn't it incredible? How did God pack, pack all that in? I don't know. The messages on our nervous system travel up to 248 miles an hour. It's pretty quick. What do we learn from this? God is creative. He's put that creative spark in us. God is a great engineer. He's worthy of our admiration, isn't he? Let's go on. God is vast. The word vast doesn't do, doesn't do justice to how vast God is. But anyway, we've only got the limits of human language here. Um, the scripture here in Isaiah 40, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens, who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains, on the scales and the hills in a balance. This is what God has done. He's held, he could, I mean, it's anthropomorphic language, talking about God as having human uh, limbs and characteristics, but you understand that God could, at least metaphorically, but certainly physically could, hold all the waters of this planet in his hand. That's a vast hand. Uh, how, how much water is that? Um, is this many liters. I don't know, uh, D David is a mathematician, statistician. He could tell you the, the correct number for the billion, quintillion, thingy-me-bob number, whatever it is on the end. I don't know how many numbers that is. It's a lot of liters of water. It's nothing to God. And that's just, of course, water on one planet. Who knows about so many others. Another part of Isaiah 40, lift up your eyes, look to the heavens, who created all these? Talking about the stars. He who brings out the starry host one by one, calls forth each one of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. I like the idea that God has named all the stars. I don't know if he's really bothered to. I think the writer is saying he can, he could, you know, I don't know. Humans, we give new names to stars when they come up, right? And they're usually X757G4 or something. I, I, nothing very exciting. But, but we're still finding all these stars, and, and God knows all of them by name. Here's a close-up of the Eagle Nebula. Um, this is 7,000 light years away, a little bit further than Watford. 
7,000 light years away. That column you can see there on the left-hand side, that column is several light years long. God made all these things. To God, none of this is difficult. So if you're going to go to the Eagle Nebula, uh, 7,000 light years away, that's 4 times 10 to the 16 miles. David will check my maths later, which is um, uh, this many miles. If you were to travel at 40 miles an hour, it would take you this many years to get there, sticking to the 40 mile an hour limit. It's nothing to God. Just a bit of perspective on scale here. Let me just, uh, there's the earth, all right? That's our approximate size compared to the sun as a comparison. I mean, you think the, you think the earth is big. And that's the sun, and even our sun isn't that big, really, compared to many suns and stars. So about a million of our Earths would fit inside the sun. God is vast. We don't have a good enough word for it. Here's a galaxy. The closest galaxy is 2,200,000 light years away. That's the next nearest galaxy. The Hubble Telescope. Very, very helpful in revealing new stars and galaxies and all that. Um, they reckon that there are somewhere between 100 and 500 billion galaxies in the universe. Not stars, galaxies. They actually don't know, of course, but they, the number is increasing because they keep finding and seeing more stuff out there. Uh, but it's somewhere between 100 mi- uh, billion and 500 billion I. Uh, I, I just don't even, as I, I can sense this from you, <laughs> sensory overload here, you know, like, or, or cognitive overload, just trying to, un, trying to grasp, how about one billion, how, how about a million, how about, how about just understanding one galaxy? I, God is vast, God is, in, God is creative, God is a great engineer, God is vast. The question we need to ask ourselves, and I think we all want to know about is, But does God really care? I mean, someone can be creative. Or a God could be creative. A God could engineer great things. A God could be huge, vast, amazing, great, mega, all the words we are going to run out of. But does he care? You see, our theme today is transcendence. And theologians talk about the the transcendence of God and the imminence of God. And these two things need to go together. The word imminence there, meaning his presence, his his, his closeness to. God is transcendent and God is imminent. If God is only transcendent, he's no good to us. We can't have a relationship with him if he's not imminent. If he's imminent but he's not omnipotent, if he's not got the power, then he's, again, no good to us. He's not transcendent. He's not truly God. God has to be transcendent and imminent. How do we know? We know he's transcendent. Surely we do because of just a few things we've touched on here about how amazing the world we live in is and humankind is and, and the, the, the universe is. But is he truly imminent? And this is one of the wonderful, most glorious things about Christianity is that he is imminent because God, God is love. God is vast. He is creative and he's a great engineer, but he is love. We see this most clearly in Jesus. Jesus who touches the leper. Doesn't just heal the leper, but touches the leper. Jesus who spends time with the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years and no one else would spend time with. Spends time with the Syrophoenician woman. Spends time with the widow whose son has just died and raises the son back to life. The one who breaks all the taboos of his culture and society of the time so that he can reach out and touch people and not only heal them, but let them know they are loved. God will let you know that you are loved if you will let him. If you'll accept his transcendence and your need for him, he'll let you know. And we know that we are loved because Jesus sent his son to die for us in our place. And even on that cross, as two other criminals were there with him, there was one who said, remember me when you 
when you inherit your glory. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's not too late. It's not too late for anybody here. Wherever your heart has traveled, however old you are, however young you are, teenagers, it's not the wrong time to touch the transcendent God, to find him, to seek him, to find him. He will be found by you because he is imminent. He loves and he cares to the nth degree. What do we learn from this? If God is loving, if he is this loving, then he is worthy of our trust. The scripture. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. The words of God here through Isaiah. The one who holds the waters in his vast hand is also the one who has your name tattooed on his hand. Engraved. He's tattooed your name there. He can't forget, you know, when something's tattooed on your hand. It's just there. You can't ignore it anymore. You can't forget. And God says, that's how I feel about you. I'm not removing you. I'm not taking you away from my memory or my heart. I've got your name tattooed on this vast hand. That vast hand has enough room for all the names of all the people that have ever lived and ever will live, of course, because it's so vast. That's how he feels about us. We'll finish with Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care of them? You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And the church said, Amen. how majestic, how transcendent. God is transcendent. He is holy. He is without sin. He is pure. He is glorious. He is eternal. He is without equal. He is vast. He is timeless. He knows everything. He sustains all things. And yet, more important than that to him, he's involved with us. He's transcendent but imminent. He is worthy of our gratitude today. He's worthy of our awe today. He's worthy of our admiration today. He's worthy of our humility today. He's worthy of our worship today. He's worthy of our trust today. He's worthy of our love today. We have and we serve a transcendent God. We sang about transcendency earlier with Alex's song. We're going to sing it again now with perhaps a little more understanding, a little more connection with his theme. We're going to sing it a second time with a slightly different version that Alex mentioned earlier. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and prepare for that. We'll do that now. And we're going to, I want to ask us to have those scriptures in mind we just talked about. Have some of those pictures we looked at in your mind. Have some of those numbers in your mind again as we sing this song, Transcend. And as we do, I pray and hope that our hearts will be touched more by God's transcendence and more also by his imminence. What an amazing, awesome, transcendent God we have. Amen. Thanks for listening to this recording. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to know more about our work, you can find it all at tvcoc.org. News, announcements, information, and more recordings. Take care, and God bless.